Greetings, everybody. My name is Baron Maddock Arundel. I am a member of the Order of the Laurel from the Kingdom of Ethelmark. And I am going to talk briefly um, about the subject of presenting documentation for ANS projects, um, both competitions and displays. Uh, I want to stress right up front that um, this is not any material that is written into any handbook in the Kingdom of Ethelmark uh, or the rest of the SCA, as far as I know. Um, this is not any uh, anything that's published in uh, any guidelines for laurels or fleurs or sycamores or anybody else involved in the ANS community. Um, this is very strictly one laurel's perspective on documentation of the arts and sciences. And I, uh, I will tell you that um, in my experience, I've been involved in SCA arts and sciences um, off and on since about 1985. Um, and um, uh, over many years, I was a, uh, a dabbler in, uh, in different uh, sciences. I, I started out making uh, leather belt pouches, uh, moved on to uh, construction of armor, um, dabbled in um, fiber arts for a while, uh, dabbled in calligraphy and illumination, uh, which I was absolutely horrid at, um, and uh, a few other things. And uh, my, my laurel is actually for brewing and venting, uh, but along the way, I, I also got to be a uh, fairly decent at basic uh, woodworking at, uh, um, at some other uh, arts and sciences that um, I continue to be involved with as time goes on. Uh, in addition to that, I have been a frequent judge of uh, ANS competitions uh, in the SCA uh, for a little bit over 20 years now. Um, and I've also been uh, a judge of uh, similar competitions out in the mundane world. And so my perspective on documentation uh, in SCA ANS is based partially on my own experiences in creating documentation, but also uh, from the perspective of somebody who is attempting to assess uh, someone's ANS project and be able to provide uh, valuable and positive feedback, constructive feedback uh, to the artisan on how to improve. And documentation plays a big part in that. So. Um, those are the, the points that uh, uh, make me qualified to give you my opinion. It really is nothing more than an opinion. Uh, my opinion on uh, how documentation uh, plays into SCA, ANS, and uh, uh, how I would recommend that you approach it. So um, it's called How Do You Do That? One Laurel's Perspective on Documentation for the Arts and Sciences. And we are going to look at four uh, basic points. Uh, the first one is, and, and I get this all the time from people who are involved in uh, ANS competitions, is why do I have to provide documentation? Uh, why can't I just put my, my finished project up there and have everybody ooh and ah at it and, and uh, compete on the basis of bling factor? And uh, so we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about what actually counts as documentation. And for any of you that uh, may have been involved in uh, any roundtable discussions or uh, order meetings or anything like that, that, uh, that talk about it, you will have heard several different opinions of what constitutes documentation. We're going to talk about why the format in which that documentation is presented is important. Um, and believe me, speaking from the perspective, uh, of a judge or an assessor um, format is important. And then we're going to talk about the finished product and not the finished ANS product, the finished documentation product. So right off the bat, why do documentation? And I will tell you right now that for any other reason out there, documentation, the purpose of documentation to me boils down to two things. This is the first one, and this is purely from the assessor point of view. As a judge, as an assessor, as a counselor, uh, 
um, as a, a laurel to an apprentice. When I look at your documentation, it gives me the opportunity to assess how well you know your subject matter. Um, anybody can walk into a museum and photograph uh, a piece of armor from 17 different angles and go home and do a reasonable uh, reproduction of that piece of armor as far as what the finished product looks like. But doing it that way does not contribute, it does not show me that you have a knowledge of the metal working of the period or the leather working of the period. It doesn't show me that you have a knowledge of the uh, time periods when that piece of armor may have been used, um, the techniques that may have been used to produce it, uh, how they got their proportions correct, and all these, these other factors that go into not just reproducing a piece, but understanding the materials, the processes, the, the, the depth of knowledge needed to be able to um, uh, explain that piece to somebody who may not know as much as you do about it. And so um, looking at your documentation allows me as the observer to assess your knowledge of the material, the background, the history, but also how you applied that knowledge to the project at hand. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, explaining when you've documented one aspect of a piece, but then you've gone on to use different materials or different um, processes and, and how your documentation plays into um, uh, that as well as an explanation. But there is a second reason too, and this one is not from the judging perspective. This one is from the other Skadian uh, perspective. If you have really good documentation, there is a really high probability that someone can read your documentation and replicate your project. If you provide sufficient documentation, the historical research on materials, processes, and procedures, the deviations that you made from those uh, documented uh, materials or procedures, um, a, a, a very detailed, maybe even photographed uh, timeline of, of how long it took you, what problems you encountered, uh, how you resolve those problems. If I read through that, just like a tutorial, I should have a reasonable chance of being able to go to my workshop. And um, even if I had very little familiarity uh, with the uh, mediums that you're working in, um, I should have a reasonable chance of being able to um, reproduce your project from your documentation. So. On the first part, it's for the judge to be able to provide you with critical feedback and to assess your knowledge and hopefully help you expand on that knowledge. But number two is, is your contribution to the SCA as a whole in uh, being one of the uh, people that someone can go to and say, can I see your documentation? I would really like to attempt uh, a similar project. Um, effectively, your documentation uh, becomes a, a textbook of sorts. So let's look at what counts as documentation. And we have quite a few things in here. Obviously, the one that most people think of when you say documentation is the essay or research paper. Now, I will tell you that I don't believe that documentation is inherent in research papers, because I believe a research paper is a project in and of itself. Um, and despite the fact that I tend to write research papers as documentation, um, it's, it's not really the, the best format uh, for documenting um, a piece that you're entering uh, in a display or a competition. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, research papers, essays, um, 
uh, written tutorials, that sort of thing. The most common form of documentation, anything from a three by five index card with a couple of sources on it, all the way up to a 26 page uh, term paper. Um, that, that obviously can be uh, documentation. Another type is class notes or class handouts. And a lot of people don't think about this as documentation. Um, I know uh, several people that uh, have taught at Penzik University or taught at various kingdom uh, collegia who uh, you go up to them and you say, hey, do you have uh, some documentation I could check out? And they go, oh no, I've, I've never done uh, the level of research I need to be able to document uh, the projects. Basically, uh, I just wrote down how I did things and they hand me a, a two-page printout, um, a class note with, with some sketches on it showing some, some templates or something. And um, I look at that and I go, okay, this is documentation. It's documentation of a sort. So um, you, you may not even think about it, but when you pull together class notes or when you build handouts uh, for classes that you teach, you are in effect documenting um, some aspect of your ANS activities. Um, video lectures. This is a video lecture, uh, but there are a lot of video lectures out there uh, where people will uh, talk about their project. Um, they will, uh, um, they may have a video of uh, them actually working through the project. Um, some of them get really, really fancy uh, with background music and voiceovers and things like that. Some of them are, are just turned on the webcam and, and uh, in your workshop uh, and talk about what you're doing while you're doing it. Uh, but video lectures can be considered a form of documentation. Um, Bibliography is not strong documentation, uh, but there have been times when somebody has asked me about a specific project that I've worked on and um, the question comes up, you know, well, where did you find all this information? And I will respond with, I'll send you my bibliography. Um, and while it's not specific to the project that I was working on, at least it gives the individual that I'm passing it to a, a starting point uh, for being able to do their own research. And maybe they come up with something different than what I did. Maybe they're not replicating my project. Uh, maybe they're uh, uh, coming up with something unique uh, or uh, different on their own uh, using the same sources. And if that happens, we can get together over a beer at the campfire a, a year down the line and talk about the differences in how we each evaluated those sources. Photo journals, uh, very popular um, when, uh, when people are doing something that involves multiple steps, especially multiple difficult steps, is they will literally photo document um, every, every step in a project and they will string those photos together until it's almost a movie. Um, and then hopefully they go through and they pick out some of the more salient photos and they caption them uh, for us uh, so we know what's going on in the photograph. But uh, photo journals uh, can be an effective piece of documentation. Here's the other side of photo journals. Um, one of the best ways to, to find out about uh, medieval artwork is to actually see it, extant pieces. And there are a lot of times where, uh, well, one time in particular, when I was, I was working on a gable chest for a particular competition, um, I, I actually contacted museums and, and had them send me photographs of various medieval chests of the style that I was trying to, uh, trying to create. And um, multiple uh, chests from multiple different artisans um, and also taken from multiple angles. And I had those in my, in the front of my documentation. And then in the back of my documentation, I had photographs of, of the chest that I was building uh, along the way. And so the, uh, uh, the person reading the documentation could see both the historical pieces, photographs of the historical pieces, next to the photographs of the piece that I was building, see the similarities, see the differences, and, uh, uh, of course, I provided text uh, to explain some of those differences and similarities. And then uh, one of the more common ways in the modern uh, internet age, uh, blogs and social media pages. Uh, I think we all know somebody who has a Facebook 
a page or a Facebook group dedicated uh, to uh, their art or science um, or dedicated to, a, I've had people that have built an event page for a specific project. Um, one in particular uh, that just uh, just entered a uh, one of the largest competitions we have here in Ethelmark um, had built an event page where they presented their project virtually uh, when the event uh, was canceled. Uh, blogs, I have a blog. Um, that chess that I talked about uh, building, um, when I was working on that, I relied very heavily on blogs from two other SCA people who had uh, blogged uh, both their research into historical versions of the chest, as well as uh, projects that they themselves had completed. And I, I had actually at one point in time, I had my laptop in the shop uh, with their, uh, the one guy's blog pulled up uh, because he had a six page spread on his blog and I was I was trying to follow along as I was cutting the pieces. Uh, so blogs and social media pages um, are excellent uh, ways to provide documentation to the public. What doesn't count? Well, very simply, I have heard it said uh, around the campfire, I have heard it said behind closed doors, um, well, they never document anything, but if you get them involved in a conversation, you can find out all kinds of interesting stuff. Casual conversation, whether it's with friends or total strangers, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in groups, does not count as documentation. And there's a reason for that. Um, again, my perspective only. But look at those six that I have uh, highlighted uh, on the screen. Each one of these six types of documentation is something that I can go look at or watch or listen to over and over and over again. I can have these open in front of me on the table, on the screen. I can have these laying out in front of me on the table, on the screen. I can pull up YouTube or an MP3 player, MP4 player, and I can run that video lecture. I can go backwards and forwards as much as I need to in order to be able to review all of the material as often and as in-depth as I need to to get out of that documentation what I need to get out. If I'm involved in casual conversation, I can stand there and I can spend an hour and a half talking to a friend of mine about the subtleties in roasting malt over an open flame um, versus roasting it in some sort of oven uh, or even uh, 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 using radiant heat. Um, I can talk about that all day long. They can tell me they understand. They might even take notes. But that does not constitute documentation because while it does allow me to assess your knowledge of the material and how you applied it to the project, it does not enable another person to have a reasonable chance of reproducing your work. Even the best note taker can't take down everything that you talk about in a conversation. So, um, when, when people bring this up uh, in discussions and they say, uh, yeah, they don't, they don't document anything, but if you get into a conversation with them, it's very easy to see that they know their stuff. My response is usually that's all well and good, but if there's no permanent record or semi-permanent record of that knowledge, I have no way to assess their, their documentation. I have no way to to learn from their documentation, unless I isolate them around a campfire uh, or over the phone and, and go at it. Um, so what doesn't count, what doesn't count is talking, unless you're talking on video, in which case we'll talk. So a couple other things uh, when we talk about what, what counts as documentation. What is documentation? Well, documentation, is first and foremost a study in historical materials and methods. We are a historical society. We are reenactors, um, 
uh, of a sort. We are, uh, in the arts and sciences community, academicians. And so documentation is researching what would have been used in period, what materials would have been used, how those materials would have been prepared, what equipment would have been used in the processes, um, what processes would have been used. Um, I, I know with, with some of my friends in metalworking, uh, there are huge differences in the processes used uh, in the high middle ages from, from the modern age uh, with regards to um, things as simple as tempering steel. Um, so documentation is a study, meaning I am learning what they did in the Middle Ages, and I am writing that down, or I am producing a record of that research somehow, so that when you read my documentation, you know what the historical materials and methods were. Documentation is explanations of why in the creation of your project, you substituted. So if you tell me um, in your study of historical materials and methods, this particular uh, clothing item, um, we, we, we have uh, 52 extant examples of this particular clothing item. 47 of them are in silk, uh, three of them are in cotton, and two of them are in um, uh, gold lame. I'm not a costumer, bear with me. And then you go on to say, I used linen. Okay, you've told me what they used. You've told me what you used. Please tell me why you made the substitution. Was it something simple like I had linen on hand? I liked the, the look of the linen when we were draping fabric over the, the dummy. Um, I got the linen on sale for two bucks a yard and I couldn't afford the 1150 a yard for the silk. Whatever the reason is, it doesn't matter if the reason was just, I was too bloody lazy to go to the fabric store. Whatever the reason was, <clears throat> if you deviate from what you have documented in history, in your documentation, tell me the reason for the deviation. Doesn't have to be a good reason. I just want to know. Because if I know why you deviated, I, I can know whether or not you understand the differences. If you say, well, I, I used polyester because I don't know the difference, that's different from I used polyester because silk was too bloody expensive. Lastly, documentation is a collection of primary and secondary sources. This is the single point that most of my um, compatriots will uh, argue with me. Um, there are so many people out there, uh, even at the peerage level, who say, uh, no, documentation does not have to have primary and secondary sources. Um, I will hold fast to the belief that it does. It is perfectly fine for somebody in 1980 to write an archaeological report on, on something that they dug out of the dirt from a 5th century BC uh, town that was covered under volcanic ash. But no matter how well researched that archaeological paper is, there's never a 100% chance that they know exactly what happened. Um, I remember in the fifth grade, uh, that was a, a social studies project, was we were handed objects um, that were recovered from an archaeological dig. They were facsimiles, but they were recovered from an archaeological dig in southern Italy. And we were given uh, 30 minutes to try to figure out what the, what the items were. And we had certain clues that were included in the, in the lesson plan. And... Um, uh, once you, you know, you, you thought you had it, and, and so you got it and you shared your findings with the class, then you were allowed to look 
on you know behind the green door and see what the what the actual use of it was and in the explanation of the actual use they would tell you um what the archaeologist's first response was and uh, i remember uh the one item um the uh it was a sling bullet it was a, a steel football about the size of a lima bean uh, or an iron football about the size of a lima bean and um the, the archaeologists had, had guessed about six or eight different things uh, before arriving at the uh, final conclusion that this was actually part of a weapon. Um, I mean, down to, you know, one of the one of the items that they had initially thought it was was a paperweight, you know, 500 years BC. Um, if you have primary sources are very specifically a, a published source that is contemporary with the item. So if you're researching a 14th century um, shoe, a primary source is something that was written in the 14th century in the part of France that, that you are, are trying to recreate the shoe from. A secondary source is a source, whether it's medieval or not, that references that primary source. Um, primary sources are the best thing that we have going. I mean, next to being able to actually stare at the, the extant piece itself, um, the, the primary written source is, is the best thing we have going. And a secondary source is a suitable substitute. If your documentation doesn't include at least some primary or secondary sources, um, in my opinion, uh, your documentation um, could be beefed up a little bit. What is documentation not? <clears throat> and this is the one that, again, people will argue with me. Documentation is not a research paper. A research paper is an art and science project in and of itself. Yes, I write research papers when I'm documenting an entry in an ANS competition, but not everybody has to. I can write a research paper that will stand alone on its own merits and not produce anything from the basis of that research paper. What my documentation is should be a summary of that research paper. For the the piece that I have produced, so no, you don't have to write a research paper. In fact, I I heavily discourage people from writing full blown research papers or term papers um, as part of their documentation. Documentation is not a how to. Um, I can sit down and I can walk you through how to brew a batch of beer. I can write down instructions. In fact, I have one page of instructions: basic beer making how to brew a batch of beer, partial grain, partial extract, start to finish in less than a full page of text. There is not one bit of historical evidence anywhere on that page. Uh, there is not one reference. There is not one uh, uh, annotated uh, footnote. There is no explanation of period uh, methods or materials. It's a how-to. Documentation is not a how-to. Documentation is not a story on how I screwed up my, my sizer by using uh, apple cider that had preservatives in it. I can tell that story when I'm teaching a class. I can type out that story as, a, as an eye catcher on the first page of my research paper. But an anecdote about my trip through England um, and and when I, I stopped over at the uh, uh, the Prince Albert Museum and and realized for the first time in my life that period scribes didn't erase the pencil lines uh, on scrolls after penning them, um, that's a wonderful anecdote. If I don't have a picture of it or I don't have something in writing talking about it, it's just an anecdote. It's not documentation. Documentation is not an argument or a debate. I can write a position paper. Uh, in fact, I have written a position paper, and it started an argument and a debate in, in several circles, um, and that was all well and good. It was one of the reasons that I wrote it was because I wanted to start a debate on it. But documentation is not, is not intended to start an argument or a debate. Documentation is intended to show historical materials and methods for a particular project or item and then how I use that information to produce the item that you see before you. 
Documentation is not an activity log, although some people will use activity logs as part of their documentation, particularly the photo journalists um, who will track their activity along the way. And I can talk about my activity when people say, well, how long did it take you to make that? Um, and I say, well, it took me about seven weeks. I had estimated four days. I was a little bit off. Here's my activity log to show you uh, why it took so long. But an activity log does not substitute for documentation. Again, documentation is how did they do it in period? How did I do it this time around? And here are my references. That's what documentation, that's what counts as documentation. Let's talk about format real quick. One, the reader needs to be able to follow the text. So format is important because if I just throw stuff down on paper, I've, I've actually seen a guy came to a brewing competition, had his beer um, all set up. I asked to see his documentation. He handed me a spiral notebook, kind of like you take to, to class in high school. He had scribbles in the margins. He had, he had ideas written sideways up the side of the page. Uh, he had arrows drawn in where he'd circle a block of text with a big arrow, carrying it over to some other uh, part of the, uh, the page. Um, there, there were blank pages in between uh, his notes. There were other notes on other projects in between his notes. The guy basically had kept an A&S diary and rather than transcribe the um, information that was specific to this bottle of beer, he just handed me his diary. And he was upset when I marked him down for documentation. I need to be able to follow the text. Again, going back to that second reason why documentation is important is the reader needs to be able to have a reasonable chance to replicate your project. And in order to do that, I need to be able to read your documentation. I got to be able to follow it. It has to have some kind of logical sequence. Two, the reader needs to be able to verify the sources. Um, I'm, I'm going to commit a crime here. I'm going to talk about Wikipedia. Um, if you go to Wikipedia and you read through any particular article, um, if, if it's a particularly good article, uh, one that's particularly well researched, you'll see a lot of footnotes uh, through the text and they, they reference the sources that are usually appended at the bottom of the article. And every once in a while you'll be reading along and you'll see somebody make a claim, for instance, um, you'll see uh, Henry VIII was very fond of sage beer. And then in parentheses, right after that phrase, you'll see little tiny blue italics that says citation needed. The citation needed was put in there by one of the volunteers that, that moderates Wikipedia. And the reason that they put that in there is the author has just made a claim of historical accuracy. Henry VIII liked sage beer. This is a claim of knowledge to what kind of beer Henry VIII liked. Where did you read that? How did you know that? If you footnote it, I can check your source and go, hey, yeah, look at that. It says right in here. Henry VIII had some guy on retainer to provide two barrels of sage beer every month. And I've got a source that I can verify. Furthermore, I might be able to use that source. So there might be stuff around Henry VIII's sage beer preference um, that I can use uh, if I'm trying to not replicate your work but modify, um, have my own version of your work. I need to be able to verify your sources. I can't do that if you don't tell me what your sources are. So both footnotes and bibliographies are important. We'll talk about that in detail in a minute. Um, and then item two, the reader needs to be able to replicate the project. If I can follow the text, if the text follows a logical sequence and I can verify the sources, that third point is moot. 
if I can, if I can accomplish those first two, I can replicate that project. Assuming I don't, you know, have problems cutting off my thumbs with power saws or something like that. A couple other things to talk about, and this is purely, purely from the judge's perspective. One, less is more. Um, I remember entering an ANS competition one time. I had to have five entries in five different categories. And I had four locked up. I, I had uh, uh, a couple of things related to brewing. I had a wooden chest. I had a heraldic display. And I'm, and I'm struggling to come up with that fifth one. And I thought, you know, I used to do a little bit of illumination in my youth. I wasn't very good at it. But I need a fifth project. Let's do a simple illuminated capital letter. And so I plucked one out of a Welsh document, a nice, simple uh, green and red uh, capital letter C. And um, my documentation was seven pages long. I documented five different uh, types of red uh, pigment and four different types of green pigment. I then documented black pigment because that when I did it, I outlined everything in black and then filled it in with the with the colors. Um, I documented the the paper that I was using. Um, seven pages, seven pages for a, a two color capital letter. Um, when I went back in for feedback, I was talking to one of the judges who happened to be a Laurel in calligraphy and illumination. And uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> one of her online papers was part of my bibliography. Um, I had used her as one of my sources, uh, but she she actually as she's handing me back my documentation, my packet of documentation. She says, "Let me give you a couple of tips." She says, "I got 15 minutes to look at your entry." She says, "I'm, I'm judging 40 entries in in a couple of hours. I got 10, maybe 15 minutes to look at your entry. Two things you need to do: one, provide a summary." whether it's a, 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 a paragraph briefly summarizing everything like an abstract, uh, whether it's a bullet list of important facts with a page reference next to it in case I wanna look something up uh, further back in your documentation, throw down a cover sheet that summarizes your documentation. Number two, you don't have to document red. If something is so widely known in the community that anyone working in that community is assumed to have some basic knowledge in it, unless you've discovered something new and exciting or you are presenting some twist on, on the accepted norm, you don't have to document unknown. She says the entire illumination community knows what those um, five different reds are made from. You used gouache paint. Give me one sentence that tells me what were the different shades of red and which one you picked. So she taught me less is more, that judges just don't have time to read a lot of documentation. So don't use flowery language. Um, don't, don't talk around the point. Don't try to use big words instead of small words. Just very bluntly lay it out. Boom. Henry VIII likes sage beer, says so in this book. Here's where I bought my sage. Two, readers love summaries. She said, make sure you have a cover page that summarizes your documentation. If we want to know more, we'll look back through the documents. Three, bullet statements are your friend. What's a bullet statement? It's a, it's a one line with a lot of extraneous words taken out of it. Henry VIII liked sage beer. Boom, bullet statement. Roasted barley comes from roasting malted barley. Boom, bullet statement. Remove all the fluff. And the bullet is the little dot or arrow or diamond or whatever. Uh, that is off to the left of it, marking it as a new entry on your unnumbered list. Uh, so when you're writing your summary, you can write it, like I said, as a paragraph, or you can write it as a list of bullet statements. You can also use a bulleting uh, for your references. 
Um, and then last but not least, a picture really is worth a thousand words. In that same documentation, that seven page illumination documentation, I had a photograph of the actual page out of the, the uh, 12th century Welsh book. And I said, boom, here's a photograph of the letter that I am recreating on this piece of paper. I didn't have to say another word about it. I threw that photo up there. I said, this is what I was recreating. The caption on the photo had the volume that it came from, where you could find that volume in the modern world, as in which museum or private collection it was in. And that was it. I was done. That picture was a thousand words. Did they use this style of hand? Yes, look, there's the picture. Did this exist in Wales? Yes, look, here's the, doc, the, 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 the caption under the picture telling you where it's from, so on and so forth. The more photos that you can, I won't say the more photos, the more salient photos that you can include in your documentation, the less actual text you need to type because you can type an explanation of what I'm looking at in the photo, and the photo is doing the rest of the explaining for you. A lot of photos, like photos. So let's talk about what the finished product should look like. All right, one, number one issue I have with people entering competitions. They build a thing, and then they go, you know, there's a competition coming up the end of next month. I should enter this thing. Let's go document it. Well, F me, they didn't have buckwheat hats in 14th century Milan. Son of a gun. Don't back it in. It's wonderful if you build a thing and you want to show it off in an ANS display or you want to enter it into a competition. You're going to take a hit on documentation points 90, 99 times out of 100. Don't try to back in the documentation. If, if it's a spur of the moment thing, fine. Slap something down on a three by five index card and press on. If you're seriously looking at a competition six months or three months or whatever down the line, uh, here it's Ice Dragon. We look at it a year ahead of time. Um, figure out what you want to do, then go do the documentation. And then using your own documentation, build the thing. Adjust your documentation for any photos or explanations of your process along the way. But all of your historical research needs to be done up front. Your assessment of the materials, of the methods, of the um, ingredients, of the tools used, your assessments of those based on the historical research needs to be done before you do the thing, before you even purchase the materials to do the thing. Two, work back to the original sources. If I am reading a book entitled um, Female Brewers in Medieval England, and somewhere in that book, the author quotes a source, and he footnotes it, and it tells me where in the bibliography to find that source, and I flip to the bibliography, and oh, look, it's a book that I can purchase on Amazon, look at on Google Books, uh, get photographs of from the library, Xerox copies from the Library of Congress, get photographs of from the private collection of the Earl of Spencer in England by making a few emails and phone calls. If it's a, a document that I can reach back to, don't quote the author of the secondary source if I'm using the quote that's in the primary source. Go, oh look, he's, he's quoting a source. Let me set this book aside and pull out the original source. Now I can read it in the context of the full page or the full chapter, but also now I am citing the primary source. So as much as, especially if you're using Wikipedia, Wikipedia is a great place to go to find sources. I don't quote Wikipedia, 
but I will use Wikipedia and their very intense bibliographies to go back and look at original sources. Always try to work back to the original sources for your material. You don't want to, I wrote a 26 page documentation paper one time. Don't do it. Nobody reads it. If somebody is not serious about reproducing your project, they're not going to look at it. You want to be thorough. But this goes back to why you don't use a lot of flowery language and why you don't puff, puff up, you know, you, this is why you use bullet statements or, or short sentences. Um, say what needs to be said and move on. Um, you want to be thorough. You want to give people reading your docs the chance to be able to replicate your project, but you don't want to make it a chore to actually read your documentation. They should be able to read through it um, for, for content um, in 10, 15 minutes. They should be able to go back and read through it for clarification uh, in another, another half hour or so, and then have it available to work through the project. Three rules of any good finished product. Cite, cite, cite. I was going to say citation, 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 but it didn't fit on the slide very well. So here's the thing. I, I read your documentation so I can find out what the historical basis of your project is. I am interested in finding out more about this subject matter. Where can I go look for additional information? Son of a gun, he didn't footnote anything. She didn't provide a bibliography. Now I got to call you up and go, hey, I was reading your paper on brewing sugars, simple and complex. And I noticed that you, you expounded immensely using many scientific terms, but you don't cite any, any sources on the use of those sugars in, in period brewing. I was kind of wondering, how do you know they used them? Oh, well, I went to Van Vilsnack and I went to, to you know, R Ruddy Harrelson and I read through, you know, Brew Your Own magazine, um, whatever. And here's, here's, here's all that documentation. If it's important enough for me to tell you over the phone, it's important enough for me to put in the, in the docs. Let me see where you got the information from. which of course comes to the bibliography. So any claim you make to historical fact in the body of the paper, there should be a footnote, end note, or inline citation. And any source you referenced, even if you don't cite the source in the body of the paper, if you read part of a chapter or a book or a magazine article, that supported some other source that you did cite in the article, or that had uh, some expanded viewpoint of some topic that you touched on in the paper, or inspired you to go look at another source, whatever the reason, if you referenced it, whether it's cited in the body of the paper or not, you can include it in your bibliography. Now, don't just throw a bunch of sources down to pad your bibliography. If you are unfortunate enough to have somebody who knows more than you about that art or science, um, when they're judging you, they're going to recognize bibliography padding uh, when they see it. Um, I've, I've seen it several times. Um, but if you legitimately got information out of that source, even if you didn't cite that information in the body of the paper, go ahead and include it in the bibliography. It shows breadth of research as well as depth. So the finished product should meet two primary objectives. State the historical evidence with citations, then describe how you did your project and explain any differences from what you have documented. And you can do this, you can say, here's my historical documentation, here's how I did it. Or you can say, historically documented oak, used maple. Historically documented hand tools, used power tools. Historically documented cutting with the grain, 
cut against the grain. You can do it piecemeal where you, you show your documentation for one part of the project and then explain how you deviated in that part of your actual build. Or you can do all of the historical documentation up front and all of the project uh, explanations uh, after the fact, but you need to include both. I got dinged really heavy one time uh, when I submitted documentation for a project and um, I had two versions of the, the documentation because they were a work in process. And um, one of them was my historical evidence and one of them was the explanation of my, my process. Well, I had intended to append the two articles together and then print it out, but I got in a hurry because I woke up late and I was, I was late getting out the door to go to the event. And, and I printed the documentation before appending the uh, uh, description of how I did the project. So I get up there and, and judge after judge after judge said the same thing. Excellent historical research. I would have liked to have known more about how you actually did it. And I'm like, crap, I printed the wrong documentation. All right, citations, how do we do them? Well, there's three ways. Um, three ways most common that people use. The uh, inline citation, that's where you say, Henry VIII liked sage beer, and then you put up a set of parentheses, and in there you put the author's name and a page number. So, you know, Finnegan, page 156. I want to know more about it. I can go to your bibliography. I can note that Finnegan wrote Henry VIII's favorite beer uh, in 1932, and uh, uh, I know that if I can secure a copy of that book, Somehow that if I look at that page, I can see the context in which you, you footnote it. It's a very simple way of doing it. Uh, another way of doing it is you put the little number, uh, the little sub superscripted number one or, or whatever, uh, as you can see here in the, whoops, here in the example, uh, that little superscripted one. And then down at the bottom, you can put a simple footnote. Simple footnote, Finnegan, Henry VIII's favorite beers, page 157. Again, it's just enough to prompt me to go look at your bibliography and see what you're talking about. My favorite is what's called the annotated footnote. And the annotated footnote, you still use the little uh, hypertext here, uh, the superscripted number, but down here in the bottom, uh, and this is a perfect example of it, you can see here for uh, footnote one, David Young, in his chapter on Byzantium, also emphasizes, um, reads the poem as a working out of the artist's desire for immortality. He argues that sooner or later, readers must consider that this poem is about the relationship, yada, 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 yada. The annotated footnote is still gives me the reference, David Young, Troubled Mirror, Study of uh, Yeats the Tower, uh, page 17. But the annotation allows me to explain something. So up here it says, Yeats took great pains to manufacture, which is repeatedly and faithfully taken up in biographical study of his poetry, itself the golden bird of his Byzantium, that artificial monument in which he figures his own immortality. Now, the flow of my paper says, it's time to move on to the next section of the paper. But there's a, an off topic point or a tangential point or a complementary point that doesn't belong in the main body of the paper, but I still wanna talk about it because it adds a little bit of clarity to the situation. So I, I add that text down here in the annotated footnote. Hey, where I got this blurb from, I also got these other two blurbs. Don't, worry about the style. I'm not grading you like your English professor. I don't care if you use inline APA standard. I don't care if you use MLA standard, one space or two after the period, Oxford comma or not, Chicago style, Turabian, whatever style of formatting, I don't care. You can mix and match them throughout the paper. What I care about is that you have a citation so I know where you got the information. If your paper is logically laid out and I can find the citations, 
I don't care about the format. In the bibliography, I want a variety of sources. I want to see breadth. So I'm a brewing laurel. Let's talk about beer. I want to see sources that talk about grain and the malting process and hops and yeast and bottling or kegging and uh, uh, ways of dealing with off flavors. I want to see a, a source or two covering, now maybe some of those aspects I didn't address in the documentation, that's fine, leave those out. But anything that I, I talked about in the documentation, I want to see one or two sources for that information. So in a paper on a beer, uh, I entered a simple recipe. I cited the malt, I cited the hops, I cited the, the uh, honey, and I cited the yeast. I had nine sources for that. So I had a source, at least one source, for each aspect that I had addressed in there. But I also want to show depth. I don't want to pull 100% of my research on the malting process from one book, even if it is Van, Vel Van, Vel Van Vilstern. Even if it is one of the foremost authorities on the malting process, I don't want to just cite him and go, I followed all of his rules. I want to be able to show that I know a variety of information regarding that process. So I want to show both breadth and depth in my bibliography. Um, and, and you can do that with as, as few as half a dozen uh, sources on a, on a simple documentation. Um, I've had up to three pages of bibliography on some of my more in-depth docs. Um, you don't need three pages of bibliography, but you do need to have a bibliography that is sufficiently broad and deep to allow your reader to follow up and find out more about the project. Um, when you reference your works, both in the citations throughout the work and in the bibliography, it's giving credit where credit is due. So even if you are using a fellow SCA member uh, or a college professor or a fraternity brother or sorority sister, even if you're using somebody like that as one of your references, give them credit. They worked hard to do their research to publish their work. You want to give them credit where credit is due. Um, but also the bibliography is an outstanding place for you to highlight your primary and secondary sources. And I, I do that in a couple of different ways. One is when I have a primary and secondary source, I tend to bold face it just to, to draw the judge's eye towards it. But the other thing is if I have, uh, say I have a translation of a primary source or I have a primary source that was referenced uh, in total, uh, say like an entire chapter was reprinted in a secondary source, I will go ahead and I will reference the primary source as my far left uh, marker. And so it, it'll say, um, you know, um, in vino veritas by Pliny the Younger, um, you know, 55 BC or whatever the, the proper time frame is. And then I will have comma as presented in uh, the life and times of Pliny the Younger by John Smith. Uh, published in Massachusetts, uh, 1973. So it's an opportunity to highlight um, the, the primary and secondary sources. Mostly though, sufficient for the reader to follow up and showing breadth and depth. Um, you wanna let the judges know uh, what's going on. So here's the bottom line. Um, documentation is not for you. Um, now, as I said before, if you're doing it right, you are doing your documentation first, and then you're building your piece from the information you have found out by doing the research. But it's not for you. The documentation is for everybody that looks at your piece, everybody that oohs and ahs, everybody that asks you questions about your process, everybody that asks you how difficult was that to do, could you teach me how to do that? I've always wanted to learn 
or I'm just fascinated with the life and times of ancient Byzantium. And even though I have very little interest in uh, how to make Byzantine garb, um, I'm really interested in reading more about those cloak pins. Could you direct me to some sources that I might find interesting to read? It's intended for an interested audience, whether they're interested because they're judging you, whether they're interested because they would like to provide some um, positive feedback or some uh, critique in order to help you improve in your art or science, or whether they're just interested because they found it fascinating and they want to know more. You're writing the documentation for everybody else. The easier you make it for them to read and follow, the more highly they are going to think of the project uh, that you spent so much time researching. So um, as I said, that is one person's, one Laurel's perspective. I guarantee you, if you ask 10 other Laurel's their opinion on documentation, you're going to get 10 other opinions. Um, but uh, that is my perspective on documentation. One, I consider it to be very important. If you're just a novice uh, trying to get a little bit of uh, uh, face time, and it's one of those competitions where they say um, documentation not required, or minimum documentation, like in, in the brewing community, minimum documentation is you provide a recipe. But we're concerned with, with allergies to certain ingredients. So, um, you know, yeah, more power to you, dude. Pump it out, put it in the display, throw down your three by five index card saying, I think this is eighth century Viking. Um, you know, whatever it is, if that's what the, what the situation is, is asking for, by all means, don't go overboard. But if you're serious about advancing your art beyond that novice level, um, you do need to look seriously at providing um, evidence that you're doing the historical research, that you're able to apply the historical research and make reasonable substitutions when it's warranted. And then most importantly, that you can convey that information to an audience in a form that allows them to replicate your work. That's the importance of documentation in producing an art or science project in the SCA. So any questions, uh, you can get a hold of me at the uh, Ethelmark Facebook page um, and any of my various uh, emails, because if you're watching this, you probably already know me. And if you're not, um, go to Ethelmark and they will ping me. Um, I welcome any feedback on this. And uh, then I will also encourage you uh, to look at um, another offering. I don't have it posted yet, but I will uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Um, I was just talking about the importance of documentation and how to uh, present it in this short video. I will have a much longer uh, video that talks about how to actually do the research behind the documentation. So I will encourage you to look for that when it comes out and follow that as well. Uh, thank you so much for watching uh, uh, up to this point, and hopefully I will see you later.